Good morning, Biology 11 students. Today we're going to be talking about phylogenetic relationships. Um, basically looking at uh, what branch on the tree of life you sit on and who's sitting on the same branches as you. So, um, let's get into it. So, what is phylogeny? Because phylogenetic relationships are based on phylogeny. So, it's important to know what it is. All right? Just moving my chair in a bit. So, it's the theoretical evolutionary history of a species. All right, why is it theoretical? Well, we talked about the fossil record, and we said in the fossil record there are missing links, right? The fossil record is not complete, and our ability to get DNA in that and see who's really related to who is it's getting better with fossils, but it's not 100% yet. So there are these little gaps there, it is theoretical. But it's basically your ancestry. Your evolutionary history basically provides who you're related to, and that's your ancestors if you think back in time, right? So what we look at are monophyletic groups or clades, right? And what these are, these are organisms that belong to the same group, right? They're descendants from the same common ancestor. So we look at our tree of life here, Darwin's tree of life included everything, right? So on this tree of life, we might have the protists and the bacteria here, right? And we have archaea bacteria, you bacteria, we have, you know, plant-like and animal-like protists, however it happens to be, right? This might be the plants and fungi root here, right? So plants and fungi are there, drew a little P for plants, a little F for fungi. Here are the animals, right? We know that we're animals, so we're going to be somewhere on this limb. So if we talk about a monophyletic group, and we're talking about the animal kingdom, our monophyletic group starts right here with this branching, where the animals come out, right? Now, maybe we're going to divide those animals up, out, you know, apart from each other, based on whether or not they are a chordate or an invertebrate. And that means, again, for you and me, that this would be our branch here. So we're talking about chordates, it's this branch. If we're talking about animals, it's this branch. If we're talking about any living thing, it's the entire tree. And then with the chordates, right, there'd be some more branching, right? And then maybe we get to mammals right here and these would be things like birds and fish and all the rest of it but here's our mammalian line so again we would be here but less things would be on it think the thinner branch supports less things it would crack if you put too many things on it and then you might have primates coming off of that and then humans here right here's our humans up here all right you can imagine by the time you get to the tip of the tree the branch is very thin a thin branch can't hold very much weight, which means it holds very few species. So life is all living things. But as you go further and further and come up with more and more resemblances that make you the same as something else, you start to see that your branch gets very, very small pretty quick. Here's all of our animals. Well, the animals only account for a certain amount of living things. Chordates, invertebrates, well, we already split those up. We know there's a lot of these invertebrates. The chordates we break up into... Agnatha, Chondrichthys, Osseichthys. You remember all those awesome terms from diversity. So, and then we get, again, mammals, primates, humans. We're one small branch, right? Anyway, depending on how you want to look at it, primates would be this branch right here. And then we'd have branches for chimps and apes and such things, right? Mammals would be this area of the tree here. We have all our different types of mammals, cats, dogs, wolves, moose, us, the primates, right? Chordates would be a larger section of the tree from this point up. Animals would be a larger section. Life is an even larger section. So that monophyletic group or clade, the size of it depends upon, well, what you want to study, what group you want to study, right? And it links up hand in hand with the levels of taxonomy, right? So these evolutionary relationships illustrated in the tree of life can be illustrated using either a phylogenetic tree or a cladogram. Now we're going to be building cladograms today and we're going to be doing them as an assignment later on down the line. So what we're going to be using to build these things to show these relationships 
is a system of classification based on shared derived traits called cladistics, a cladograms based on cladistics. But before we get into that, I want to simply go over how a phylogenetic tree is set up because it's another way of showing these relationships and it actually kind of looks like our tree here. All right, so I'm going to move this out of the way. And I'm going to erase such a, that's a good looking tree. I got to erase it though. So let's talk about a phylogenetic tree. Now I can't do a phylogenetic tree of all living things. It's just, it's too much. So what I'm going to do is a phylogenetic tree of some common reptiles. All right. So when we do a phylogenetic tree, basically there's two axes. The first one is time. All right, so put time here, and this is the past, and up here is the present. All right, so the present day things like me and you and, you know, your pets and other animals that are alive on the planet today, they're all along this line. I'll kind of put a little dotted line there just as a guideline, so anything that reaches this line that dotted line. Hopefully it shows up on the video. I believe it will. So ending up on that line present day, walking around or slithering around on the planet today. Everything below that line is past its ancestral, right? Now down here we have morphology. This marker is starting to quit on me. I will have to get rid of it and get another one. So morphology. Now, morphology, if you remember, means shape or form, right? So we're going to be using those characteristics that we inherited from our ancestors and the commonalities between them to decide who's sitting on the same branches of this phylogenetic tree. All right, I'm going to get rid of that, and I'm going to grab a red one, and it'll show up. So we're doing a phylogenetic tree. Three. Yeah, the red's working much better. All right, so what we start out with, and we're doing one for reptiles. I'll put it off to the side here. Reptiles is what we're doing here. So we start out with a single line coming up. This is our common ancestor, all right? So there's our common ancestor. So this is the common ancestor of the reptiles. This is the original reptile. All right. Now we know today we've got a bunch of different reptiles, right? So let's look at two common reptiles that may have branched off of this one. One would be a turtle and one would be a crocodile. Now for a common ancestor reptile looks kind of like a lizard. Just think of a lizard, right? So this was a, an ancient lizard. Now I think crocodile, turtle, which one looks more like a lizard? Well, I'd say easily the crocodile. So that means over time, the shape or form from a lizard to a crocodile has deviated or changed very little. So if I draw that, maybe it just goes over a little bit like this. So if I look at it, here's our ancient lizard. And if I extend this down, our crocodile, right about here, there's very little change over time. It got larger, maybe those ridges, the leatheriness of it, right? So there's a little bit of change. But a crocodile looks like, and I'll just write croc, it looks like a lizard. Now the turtle, the turtle definitely looks less lizard-like. So I can't put the turtle here because that would mean, in terms of morphology, the turtle is pretty much the same as this ancient lizard, and it's not. So the turtle I would have swinging out a lot further. So if I look here, here's my ancient ancestor, and here's the turtle. There's a lot more changes in morphology, or the form or shape, right, than there is between the crocodile and lizard, right, the turtle and the lizard ancestor had a lot more change, right? We have the shell. Um, 
that longer streamlined body is lost, right? Um, the crocodile just looks more like a lizard, the turtle less. So I show that. Here's my ancient lizard-like ancestor. The crocodile's only deviated a little bit. If I extend that down, there's only a little change in morphology. If I extend the turtle down from where the turtle meets up here and come down, you'll see there's a lot more, all right? Now, let's add a couple more in here. Now, if we look at something like, for instance, a snake, and I said, okay, a snake's a weird one because these both have limbs, right, arms and legs. But a snake doesn't. But if I look at the head of a snake, it does look more like a turtle's head than a crocodile's head. I think we could agree on that. So with the snake, I would put the snake even out further. I would have the snake come out here. Now, this is my own thinking. It doesn't mean it's the absolute truth. But I look at the snake and say the head of a snake is very close to the head of a turtle. It's not really like the head of a crocodile. All right? So I have the snake coming off of this line. Now, what I can't do is this. I can't have snake coming off of here. Because then we've got a three, one, two, three branches coming out of one ancestor. We can't do that. There can only be a fork in the road that has a left and right option. So if I'm going to add another one, I have to branch it off somewhere else. So here our road is single, and it branches into a left and right. So I put the snake here. Our ancient lizard had limbs. The snake doesn't, so I pushed it out even further. So here's my lizard, and here's my snake. There's a bunch of changes that have taken place there. Now, another one. Let's go within, with a gator, an alligator. An alligator looks a lot like a crocodile. So I'm going to have the alligator probably closer to the croc than I am to these two. And so I might put the alligator here. And I'll just see if I can squeeze gator in there neatly. So the gator's near the crocodile. It's got a few little differences, right? Truthfully, I would have the alligator a little bit closer, but I got to be able to write the name in there. But there's very few differences here. And again, it's closer to the, if I extend that down, it's closer to the ancient lizard than either the turtle or the snake. All right? Because these look like larger lizards. So that's kind of how a phylogenetic tree looks. You have time here. All of these are present day creatures. That's why I put them on that dotted line that I kind of very lightly put in there. My time in the past, I have my ancient ancestral line. I must have this because these creatures just didn't come out of nowhere. So I have my ancestral line. And then all my divisions only have two options, a left and a right option. And again, compared to my ancient ancestor, who looked the closest? These two did. These two look less like a lizard. All right? So that's a phylogenetic tree. Kind of a, a quick five-minute lesson on that. Now let's get into the cladograms that we are going to be focusing on in our class. If you want to take a further look at this, pause the video right now, and uh, I'll continue. All right, I'm going to bring our iPad back in with our course notes. You know the setup and how it works, of course. <coughs> Excuse me. So back with our classroom notes here. So cladistics, when we use that to build a cladogram, and I guess for the phylogenetic tree as well, it's true, we use synapomorphies. Now, if we look at the word synapomorphies, right, if we look at the etymology of it, synapomorphies, it'd be embarrassing if I misspelled it when it's right here on the screen. So synapomorphies, I see morph in there and I know that's shape or form, all right? Sin is same. So what we're looking at are similar or things that are the same in terms of shape or form between very, well, what we think are very different creatures, right? And as we looked in diversity, we saw that things that can sometimes seem very different can have a lot of common traits. So we use these to build cladograms, which we're about to go into, or the phylogenetic tree, which I just went over with you. So what are these? Well, these are things, these are traits that have evolved once, 
and they've stuck within the population, right? And they're inherited by two or more members of that population, two or more different species. And because those species share these traits, that we say they're related. They sit on the same branch, right, or limb of the tree. So the greater number of these that you have, the more closely related you are in terms of evolutionary history, right? So if you look at a chimpanzee or an ape and a human, we have so many commonalities with that, more so than with a dog, even more so than a rat or a fish, right? So, and, and way more than like a plant or a fungus, obviously. So the more of these we have in common, the more closely related we are to that thing. So when we apply cladistics, we're gonna be using these things. And what we have to do is we basically have to kick someone out based on traits and we keep doing that. So we'll get an array of creatures, organisms, and we look at all the commonalities and whoever has the fewest, we kick them out, all right? And that's called our out group, right? So we're gonna look for out groups. We're gonna mention a trait, hey, who has this? And most creatures are gonna raise their hand and say, oh, I, I have that. The out group's gonna go, no, I, I don't have that. If everybody else has it and this one creature doesn't, it becomes our out group. You'll see in the example, it's pretty easy to find our out groups more often than not. So it's the first group to have diverged from the other group. Now remember in divergence, divergent evolution, that's this. So they have a common ancestor. And for instance, let's talk about limbs. Everybody wanted limbs, arms and legs. And the fish said, no, no, I don't. So here's mammals, right? Oh, that's terrible penmanship. This might be mammals, right? All the other things, so it might be us, uh, a, a moose, your dog, whatever. And then the fish was like, no, right? And the thing that kicked it out was limbs, right? So everyone else said yes, it went off to the right, and the fish said no, and it goes off to the left. The fish is our out group because it doesn't have limbs. We'll get into that in just a second, a little bit more. So the next slide in this presentation, it's, it's a table and it shows synapomorphies between a variety of different living things. So here's the table. Now, I redid the table because in class, I fill in a few of the blanks and I realize I'm not there now, right? I'm doing this from a distance. So I added a couple of um, columns to the table. I believe I added warm blood and limbs to our table. In class, I didn't have them there. We had to reason it out. Um, to make things a little bit easier for us, I added those columns in there today. Hopefully, I got all the, all the things in there correct. So let's build, <coughs> excuse me, let's build a cladogram using this table. All right? So what I did is I copied our table here, and I'll use this table. This is the one that I can write on. And what you'll need is a highlighter matic 3000. Got this from Dollarama, one of the best stores on earth. I'll be using this, and what I'll do is I'll try to keep track. As I find various outgroups on this table, I'm going to highlight them. So it kind of tells my eyes, don't look at that one anymore. It's already been accounted for. So. You can see I've got the same creatures. It's the exact same table on, on your notes, right? The exact same table that is on your notes online, I've drawn it here. We'll come back to this in a second. I just want to move that out of the way. So the table is here. Now I can draw on this table, all right? Now let's look at our creatures. I've got a lamprey, that's a jawless fish, a turtle, a gorilla, a lungfish, which is a fish that actually has lungs, hence the name lungfish. Pike, wolf, and human. A pike is a fish. It's osteectes, all right? So here's our creatures. And of course, the traits are across the top here. Hair, we know what that is. Hair, fur, lungs, we know what those are. Warm-blooded, whether it's an endotherm or not. Limbs are arms and legs. A bony shell. Grasping hands means you have an opposable thumb. If I look at the direction of my fingers, it goes that way. My thumb goes in the opposite direction, but that allows me to 
grab onto things or grab onto door handles, right? That's what a grasping hand is. And jaws, we know what a jaw is. So I'm gonna put that off to the side here. And what I start out with when I do this, of course, is my ancestral line. All of these things are animals. So this will be, now I probably use a ruler, but I don't have one handy. And it would just be a mess with the whiteboard anyway. So here's my common ancestor. I don't have to write that in, but I'm writing it in so that you know what it is. So my common ancestral line, in this case, since they're all animals, this would be the ancient animal that gave rise to these animals. So this is the thicker part near the base of the tree where animals would come from. And as we go out, you'll see it branches out. Now, what we have to look for is our first out group, right? So basically, something evolves right here at that point. Something comes along and it evolved it's a trait of some sort and everybody was like oh yeah that sounds great i want that i want that i want that and one person went no i don't want that so what would that be so if i look i'm looking for something that everybody was a plus for plus means you have it and one person said no i don't want it so let's look at our traits hair doesn't fit lungs almost everybody and if we look jaws look at jaws everybody from here down said yeah jaws is a great idea except for one thing the lamprey which is a jawless fish so the lamprey is our first out group i use this column right here and i say when jaws came along everybody thought what a great idea right the lamprey said no now remember, animals don't get a choice. It happens randomly through mutation, but I'm just talking that way. Please don't think that animals are directing their evolution here. That's so Lamarckian and we're Darwinian. So, jaws came along. So at this point, jaws evolve at this point in time. Again, up here is present day. Here's our ancient ancestor. So this is in the past. I'll fill in the time when I'm done, when I make sure I can squeeze it all in here. So, who wanted Jaws and who didn't? Well, over on this side, when you go to the left, that's no. When you go to the right, it's yes. That's a rule of cladograms. So when it came to Jaws, the lamprey didn't want Jaws. So I'm going to put the lamprey up here. So the lamprey is here. Now we'll see how well I can draw a straight line. Not too bad. All right, so our lamprey is there. Now I'm gonna draw a little dotted line here. You don't have to do this, but this dotted line, again, that's gonna be present day, all right? If I was drawing this nicely on my notebook paper, I just use one of the blue lines in notebook paper, I don't have to draw this in when I'm doing it, but it helps me keep all the present day ones here. So the lamprey is gone. So I've used up lamprey. And I've used up jaws. So the highlighter, I just got rid of that. So now I'm looking at the creatures that aren't, you know, that are still available. Now, what came along next that somebody thought, hey, great idea, and everyone jumped on board, and one creature said, no. Well, if I look at it, it looks like lungs because this, this minus sign is already accounted for. I'm using from here down. And lungs only has one negative sign. Everybody else thought it was a great idea, the pike which is a fish, said, no, I'll keep my gills. So when it came to Jaws, everybody else said yes. The next trait to evolve, according to our table, which I put up there, is lungs. All right, so lungs evolved. And again, we've got a fork in the road. This way is no, and off to the right is yes. All right, I'll put little L and R underneath it here so you remember. So yes means off to the right. So a lot of the animals said, yeah, I'm, I'm down with lungs. That's great. The pike said, no, I'm going to keep my gills. They help me out in this aquatic environment. So again, trying to draw a straight line, not too bad. There's my pike. And notice that the pike 
ends up on the same sort of horizontal line as the lamprey. They are both around today. They're both here present day. Perfect. All right. So I go back to my table. And I take pike out of it. So I take my highlighter. I do that. And lungs are now accounted for. I better do the rest of this video right or else I'm going to have to do all this over again. Anyway. So my next trait. Again, I'm looking at traits and something that everybody said, hey man, sounds like a great idea, but one person said no. I got two no's here, two no's here, only one no here. This looks like my next trait. So the next trait would be limbs. Limbs are arms and legs, right? So if I look at it, limbs developed, bunch of creatures said that sounds great you know for movement Pfft, sign me up the lungfish said no i'm gonna keep my fins so lungfish is our next out group i'll see if i can draw it nice and neat lungfish said no off to the left for limbs everybody else said sounds like a good idea all right so they go off to the right so again i go back here just so it helps me keep track. I get rid of limbs, it's already accounted for. And I get rid of the lungfish. We've already kicked them out, they're the out group. Now we look for that next trait that only one person, right? Only one thing didn't want, right? So we've got four creatures left and it looks like there's actually two of them, right? Hair and warm blood. I've got multiple negatives here on the shell. And grasping hands, I've got two. So hair or blood. So what I'm going to do is, I probably should have only included one of those. So I'll, I'll readjust this when I do it next time. But I'll go with hair. Hair evolved. Helps keep that blood warm, right? And we can see that the turtle said, no, nope, no hair for me. The gorilla, wolf, and human all have hair. So they continue off in that direction. There, yes, they go off that way. Turtle, no. Now, I kind of messed up here. I put warm blood in there. I guess I didn't have to. All right? But warm blood would also be on this line as well. All right? I'll squeeze warm blood in. I'll, I have a way I can put warm blood in. Anyway, so that happened. And that gets rid of our turtle. Now, one thing I noticed with the turtle was it was the only one that had a bony shell. So if I want, I can put a circle here and I can write bony shell. Bony shell would go there, which means the turtle said no to hair, but bony shell came along. And even though it's still going left, there's no branch, which means the bony shell derived and the turtle kept it. If there's a branching here, it means the turtle didn't. But because it's one line, whatever's on that line, it means this has it. So if I put the bony shell there and the turtle was the only one, it means that it has it. There's no fork in the road here. So the bony shell does belong to the turtle. So I can get rid of bony shell now. It's being accounted for. Now what if I wanted to put warm blood on there as well? Right? I can put warm blood right here. Or I could have put hair here and switched these two. Warm blood goes here. Now there's no division left. Look at warm blood. One, two, three. All things have it. There is no outgroup with warm blood, but they all developed it too. Now whether warm blood came first or hair, I'm not sure. But for our example, we'll do it that way. So the next thing, we've got three creatures left. Gorilla, wolf, human. They are all mammals. And so now we got to find what is it and we just got rid of warm blood. What is it that two of those things have that one doesn't? Right? And they all have hair. We got rid of hair. So our only trait left is grasping hands. The gorilla has grasping hands. The human and the wolf does not. So I'm just going to write hands here, even though we know it's grasping hands because I'm running out of space. The wolf decided, nope. 
no grasping hands for me. Now, with grasping hands gone, right, if I take grasping hands out of here, I'm all out of traits. But I have two creatures left, the wolf and the human, or sorry, not the wolf and the human, the gorilla and the human. The wolf I just kicked out. I know a gorilla and a human are not the same thing. So there was some trait here that came along. It wasn't illustrated on the table, but we know these two are not the same. So now I have to try to fit that in there. Gorilla and human. I'll put this in a little bit neater. And human. So there's just an example. Now, what divides the gorilla and the human? There are some traits, but the table didn't give one. But we know, obviously, these are different species. So there would be something here. I don't label anything there because there was nothing given. All right? So that's what our cladogram would look like for this example from our notes. All right? So we look. Um, that's the finished product. All right? I'll quickly review it. You have a common ancestor animal that all these animals are related to or, or, or diverged from. Jaws developed. The lamprey said, no jaws for me. Everybody else said yes. If you notice, if I take that away, this ancestor is the ancestor to all of these creatures, not the lamprey, and it had jaws. Then lungs developed. The pike said no. Everybody else said yes. Right? If I draw that in there, little y's and n's, this was a no, this was a yes. Lungs, this said no, these guys said yes. Limbs, this said no, this said yes. Now don't draw the no and yes in there. I'm just kind of illustrating it. Limbs developed, the lungfish said no, everyone else said yes. Hair came along. The turtle said no. The turtle said, I'll develop a bony shell on my own, which I can see it did. Hair developed, and the wolf, gorilla, and human said yes. And warm blood also developed. And the wolf, gorilla, and human liked that too. So there was no divergence here with warm blood. All right? There's no one kicked out. Hands developed, grasping hands. The wolf said, I'm out. No, the gorilla and human said, sounds like a good idea. And then something else came along. It wasn't provided on the table, so we don't know what it is, but it diverged the gorilla from the human being. All right? So that's how that one would look. Pause the video if you want now and get that down into your notes. I'm going to go forward and finish off. There's only about maybe 10 minutes left, if that. So, <clears throat> excuse me. If we look at this, so if we were to interpret this cladogram right here, again, I can see all the animals here are vertebrates. So here's our vertebrate ancestor. Now, this one's set up a little bit different than ours. I've seen this set up before as well. Think of these little red marks as gates. That's what I do little gates, opening and fences. To get through the gate, you have to have whatever's written by the red gate. So here's our ancient ancestor, and it was a vertebrate, right? Because it was able to pass through this red gate. And then a bony skeleton evolved. The shark, it went off in this direction, so the shark did not evolve or develop that bony skeleton. We know a shark is chondrichthys, it's a cartilage skeleton. All the other animals went through the red gate, said, yes, I'll go through that gate. I will get a bony skeleton. The next thing, four limbs. The ray fin fish, Osteichthys, said, no, I'm going to keep my fins. I don't need limbs. Everyone else went through that gate and said, yes. The next thing was an amniotic egg. The amphibian said, no, and everybody else said, yes, I'm going to take that. So they went through the red gate. And the example we just did, amniotic egg, would be down here near the split in the road. And then we had the development of a couple of traits. Hair 
and eggs with a shell. So the crocodile, a reptile, and Aves, a bird, said, yes, an egg with a hard shell, I'll keep that. And then, of course, something diverged these two that made them dissimilar or not similar anymore. It's not listed here. And then this way, if we look, hair developed, so the primates, which we are part of, and the rodents and rabbits both said hair was a good idea. And then something developed that separated these two, but it wasn't given or listed here. All right? So I call this the gate method, right? I'm not a big as fan, I'm, I'm not a, as big of a fan of the gate method. I like our method. If you want to call our method the fork in the road method, that's what I like. And I can't spell road. So the fork in the road method. All right, but I just wanted to show you because I see these ones out here once in a while. I see a lot more like the ones we just completed ourselves, but I see this once in a while. So think of these lines as gates, where if you go through the gate, it means you have it. All right. So our last topic, applying genetic evidence. So we're using traits, right? We're using physical forms or traits, right? And what we can do now right, because science has progressed, is we don't have to rely on this entirely. We can go even further. We can look at genetic sequences. So we can look at DNA or proteins. And we can use these very much like traits. So these are our traits or our synapomorphies, right? Synapomorphies, long word. Right, so we can look at traits that have synapomorphies, but we can also look at, you know, synapomorphies, I use air quotes there, in DNA or proteins. We now have the, you know, Darwin and those guys never had the ability, they didn't even know what DNA was or its structure, but we now have the ability to sequence DNA and proteins. All right, DNA, if you remember, is nucleotides. And there is A's and T's and C's and G's, all right? And proteins, we know, are made of amino acids. And we know there's a link here, right? The central dogma of modern biology was this thing from genetics. So we know that a specific sequence of nucleotides gives us a specific sequence of amino acids. So it's all about sequence. And we know that DNA encodes for our traits. And proteins build and operate the body, so they're building and operating these traits. So by comparing sequences of either nucleotides that DNA is made out of, or amino acids that proteins are made out of, we can determine an evolutionary relationship between species, right? Think about it this way. Think of your parents and think of my parents. We're both humans, right? Your parents are humans, my parents are humans, but who are my DNA sequences gonna be a lot more alike? Like almost exactly alike, I would assume. Well, it's gonna be my parents, right? Now, your parents or another mammal, a moose, who are my DNA sequences gonna be a lot more alike? Well, it's gonna be like your parents because they're human and I'm human. The moose is not a human, so I'll have some similar things with the moose, like two eyes and, and having a heart and a liver. The moose has that, I have that. So there'll be some similar traits, but a lot more dissimilar sequences of nucleotides or proteins, amino acids. All right? So I can use this, right, to determine evolutionary relationships. Evolution is based on traits changing over time. Traits are based on our DNA sequences, and DNA is used to make proteins. We can sequence either one of these things. So we can look at the sequence of A's, C's, T's, and G's, or the sequence of amino acids. The more that you have in common, the more closely related you are. The more that you have in, different from something else, the further away from it in terms of your divergence you are. So again, if we look at it here, 
DNA will mutate over time. It changes over time. So the sequence of nucleotides and the amino acid sequence that they encode for, they change over time. And if I give a lot of time, there'll be a lot of changes in nucleotide sequences in DNA, which will result in some amino acid changes in sequence in the proteins. If I only give a little bit of time, there might only be one or two mutations, which might give me one mutation here, right? But if I gave gazillions of years, tons of these mutations, a lot more of these. So that comes back to our divergences, all right? If I have several creatures that diverged, and I have creature A, B, C, and D, and let's say I'm creature D here. So there I am, I'm creature D. If I look at the DNA sequences, or the protein sequences, the amino acids that make up the proteins, I can look at those sequences. I will have a lot more of the same DNA sequences and amino acids slash protein sequences as creature C. Our divergence, right? Remember, this is present. This is past. My divergence from C was pretty recent. So there hasn't been a lot of time for the DNA to become different and the resulting proteins to become different. So C and D will have the most similar DNA and proteins. Between myself and B or A, I will have more similarities with B than I will with A. A's divergence from my line, so this is my line here, this one, A diverged a lot longer ago. And there's been a lot more time, right? If I look, and here's present day, there's been all this time for A to become different from me. But if I look here, for C, there's only been this little bit of time. And if I look at B, there's been a lot more time than C. So time, right, is an opportunity for mutations to occur. Here, there hasn't been a lot of time. There's been a medium amount of time and a whole bunch of time here. In that time, there'd be more mutations or changes to traits, because DNA mutated, in A than there would be from C. C hasn't had much time to mutate, become different from me. All right? So that's kind of how this works. And scientists, of the things they have been able to get DNA from and sequence, they found that it fits in just like that. Um, so very few differences mean the split was relatively recent. A whole lot of difference means the split was a long time ago. The greater number of differences, the further back in time your divergence from that lineage took place. And that's it. I remember one of the earlier lectures we talked about co-evolution. We talked about creatures that often one preys upon the other, they have to co-evolve. So if co-evolution never ends between species, then the coyote and the roadrunner will never end. Anyway, do you guys even know who this is? Do you guys remember that cartoon? I don't know. You're so young now compared to old me. Anyway, that's it. I hope you understood. And uh, if there's any questions, comment in the YouTube uh, section below, the, the comment section, and I'll get back to you. Or even better, reach out to me through EDSB or in class, and uh, I'll answer your questions. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.